as a child, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to do everything. So I really ended up trying to do everything. And I've had a very sort of checkered career. I'll let you guess which one of these lovely children is me. Uh, these are my brothers and sisters. Um, and I think because of my interest, was, it was technology, it was the, the world around me, it was conservation. Gerald Durrell set his world-famous zoo up on Jersey, so I was exposed to exotic wildlife from a very age, got very interested in development and all sorts of other things. I ended up with a, a fairly mixed bag of a career, so 25 years in IT, 17 years living and working in eight or nine different African countries, running primate sanctuaries in Nigeria, doing biodiversity survey work in Uganda, doing school building in Zambia, hospital building in Uganda, taught English in Finland, did a degree in social anthropology, and it all kind of came together. Uh, the ideal job for me was to combine all those interests, and the job didn't exist, so I had to make it, and that's really what I'm doing, doing now, I think. I ended up at the end of all of that, though, at two, in 2003, working in South Africa in Kruger National Park, and we were looking at the time at how mobile phone technology was starting to emerge in rural communities. Now, this was seven and a half years ago. It was nowhere near it is now. It's phenomenal what's happened in the last seven odd years. But back then, people had a hunch that things were happening and that these mobile phones that were appearing in the hands of people earning two, three dollars a day actually might become something very, very useful. This was a report that I co-authored in 2004, one of the very early attempts to try and document what was going on. And it was hard, a lot of anecdotal evidence, a lot of, lot of hunches, but uh, I think today we've seen and we continue to witness this amazing revolution, really, that mobile technology is bringing. But it also brings a challenge. Uh, I think if you, if you ask people in the US what innovation looks like, it looks like this. It's like the iPhone 4G announced yesterday. It's this very high-tech, very sort of power-hungry, data-hungry applications, things we carry around in our pockets, and things that make our lives easier. I'm not sure if people really stop to think whether or not we really need iPads, because we can do most of the things that we can do on that on a, on a laptop, after all. The problem with this, though, is if we think about innovation in these terms, we, we forget that actually for most of the world, this stuff is totally irrelevant. It doesn't really make any difference to them at all. If you think about places like this, this is Bushbuck Ridge. It's an area on the edge of Kruger National Park where I was doing a lot of my early work. Now, iPads and a lot of the technology we're, we're roaring away with doesn't work in places like that. It doesn't work in places where there's no internet. <coughs> There are places in the world, believe it or not, where there's no internet, and, and we almost struggle to comprehend how we would live without our Gmail and Twitter and all these crazy social media things that we use. It also doesn't work on old phones and, and you know, very old models of Nokia phones and monochrome screens and ones that don't, don't allow you to download apps and do all this kind of fancy stuff. And many people are still using these phones. This is quite a modern phone in the terms of the kind of things I see when I'm out in the field. But these phones are old and don't do anything really, really smart at all. Also, these technologies don't work in the kind of places where mobile manufacturers are having to think about advertising their phones as torches, because one of the main problems people have is a lack of light at home. That's an amazing picture I took, I think, about four years ago in Uganda, and it looks like a torch ad, but it's, you know, by the way, you can also make phone calls on this thing <laughs> if you really, really want to. And this is how people are thinking about how you sell to an audience and a market which is very, very different to the one that we live in, and I think we need to be aware as we march ahead that this world does actually exist. The, the big moment for me, I suppose, that there were a couple of big moments, but the early one was doing the work in Kruger National Park, and they wanted to set up a system to start sending messages to the communities around the park, to re-engage them in the conservation effort, arrange meetings, ask them questions, uh, just generally start to talk to them a little bit more, and they were starting to get phones. And they said to me, can we set a system up that allows us to send 200 texts to 200 people, and you know we can do elephant alerts as well when elephants break the fence, all that type of stuff. And I looked, and I couldn't find anything that worked in a place like Kruger National Park. Everything needed the internet. It needed lots of money, needed training, and it just didn't make any sense. So that was kind of the gap. And the other part, really, for me was that Kruger National Parks were going to control this system. And when I was speaking to the communities, you very quickly realized that, in fact, they were the first ones who would know if an elephant had broken a fence, because they're in their fields, right? And they don't have that button to press. The people that were going to press the button and do the alerts were 100 miles away. And it made no sense. So I was thinking about where is the control? If we're building these things, and we try to think about building technologies to help rural communities, who presses that big red button? And often it's somebody far, far away and very detached from the, the situation. That's the wrong button. There we go. So the solution. <laughs> For this, for me, was, was this software called Frontline SMS. This was a second aha moment. I was sitting at home watching football 
with a bottle of beer one Saturday night, and I just thought about, hey, you know, this idea started to come through my head, and uh, it really turned out like this. It's, why not set up a communication hub that runs off of the mobile phone network which exists, which doesn't require the internet? So by installing the software on a laptop, you plug in a phone with a cable, put numbers of the farmers, healthcare workers, communities into that system, you can send them all the message. And it's very easy, and it works pretty much anywhere. And, and funnily enough, it does work in places like this, where many, many tools weren't working because they required things like the internet and high-tech equipment. The nice thing for me about, I think, what we've done, I always felt very uncomfortable traveling around and, and being seen as somebody who had all the answers to all the problems. I think very few of us really have many answers at all. You find the people on the ground in the communities, the people that have HIV or the farmers who are struggling, they have their own thoughts and their own ideas, and nonprofits that are working with them, and many of whom have worked with them for a very, very long time, actually know or have a pretty good idea how they can go about solving these problems. So rather than barreling in and actually trying to take over, why not give them tools that allow them to do what they do better? They know the language, the culture, the geography, everything that someone like I do not know. And this is a really, really nice quote, I think, for me, which, which sums up what the software is allowing these people to do. We provide it, we step back, we let them get on with it. And the uses have been pretty bewildering. You got a sense when Hannah was going through the list of the kinds of things people are doing with this. I'll give you a few examples now. But it's, it's actually staggering for me. If you actually trust people enough to do the work themselves, they actually can do some pretty innovative things. Election monitoring, Nigeria, Philippines, Malawi, it was used in the Philippine elections again this year. It was used in Afghanistan. I'll just touch on that in, in a few minutes as well. These are local groups who wanted to monitor and get a sense of how their own elections went. They didn't want the UN to come in and do it. They didn't want international organizations. They wanted to do it themselves. Nigerians were sick and tired of other people coming in and doing it for them. Using this tool, they were able to set their own systems up for the very, very first time in 2007 and do that. In Zimbabwe, it's being used to send information to rural communities who are completely starved of any meaningful news or perhaps any news at all. And also gives them a voice back. You can ask them how they feel about things, what's happening in your area. Very, very useful when, when Mugabe's flattening people's houses and doing the slum clearing and people just don't have a voice. And in many cases, using tools like this gives people a voice for the very, very first time. People that are finding that drugs they need uh, to help their children who may have diarrhea or anti-malarials, going to clinics and finding they're out of stock. Many East African governments deny there's a problem of supplying essential drugs through clinics. This is a map of places where essential drugs are not available. The bigger the red blob, the bigger the problem. This is great for government transparency. Someone can go into a clinic, try and buy a drug. If they can't get it, they can text in. It can be mapped and visualized, and it can really change the game, really. Governments find it very hard to, to, to deny there's a problem when they see maps like that. In Afghanistan, as Hannah mentioned, it's being used to send security alerts to field workers. It's been used for many years now, uh, almost from the beginning, to do that. When I blogged about this recently, I um, was, was writing about it, and I got this email that night. It was quite spooky, but I got an email that night from one of the users, and two Red Cross workers have been killed in a Taliban attack. And this, for me, sort of drove home how crucially useful and important a simple, dumb, 160-character SMS can be if it's sent at the right time and you're in the wrong place, and it can help get you out of places. And it's kind of humbling in a way to think that we're solving these problems, but it just shows that these tools, I think, really are needed. In Iraq, Aswat al-Iraq are using it to spread news around the country. They're the first international news organization since the fall of Saddam. And anti-human trafficking projects. You can embed these systems within the communities. So communities can set their own systems up, and they can control them. They can put them in their own languages. They can adapt the messaging. And that's very, very empowering. The, more, more, the latest use of this was in Haiti after 30 American aid workers or, or religious group members tried to take some children out of the country, and many of you may have heard of that. There was a lot of concern around doing that. But using this simple technology, you can embed these systems into the communities, and you can actually allow them to control and run them. Pumps to farmers. Uh, there's actually some great pumps in the exhibition around the, around the back there, the design for the other 90% uh, exhibition, which is fantastic. But farmers who express an interest in the pumps give their mobile phone number. They can then be put into systems and they can be texted when there's special offers or when there might be a demonstration in their area or to ask them how they got, got on. And that's a very nice social business use of it. And these pumps have quite a significant impact for the, 
the farmers. And in Afghanistan, this was when it was used last year to help monitor the Afghan elections. And again, these were local Afghan media groups that were doing this. It wasn't done by any large international donor. And it gave a voice to the people, this whole thing about citizen reporting and allowing people to actually say how they feel about things and their own particular experience. If you marry that with the international news, you do get this amazingly fresh and new, exciting angle on what's happened in these kinds of events. And of course, elections in Afghanistan are probably as hard as any other place you could, you could imagine. When Obama visited Ghana, a few US embassies used the software to text out to communities when the radio address was going to be on. I should probably charge the State Department for using the software. For everyone else, it's free, but you know, hey. Um, and in Malawi, this is a really interesting case. This is the last example here. Uh, a student from Stanford University went to St. Gabriel's Hospital in Malawi a couple of years ago, and he installed the software. And this is Alexander, who's the head nurse. He's running a rural healthcare network for a quarter of a million people through that laptop. The community healthcare workers, hundreds of them have got phones, and they communicate through SMS, through the whole thing. They're the 112 service in their village. They can ask about information about drugs. And it's, it's actually had a, a profound effect, and it's, it's got a lot of attention, as it rightly should, saving thousands of dollars in unnecessary journeys where people were traveling out to give patients injections who had died the night before, for example. Silly, dumb stuff, but really, really essential communication, which has revolutionized the way this hospital now delivers health care to those people. There's two doctors for a quarter of a million people, so you, you really want to use those resources as well. It's now become Front on SMS Medic, which is a spin-off organization, which is now applying our software specifically in health. Another one now is applying it in microfinance. You can run a bank from a laptop now and disperse and receive money from rural communities and small borrowers and lenders. And another one is applying it in bullying in schools. So schools can download complete anti-bullying systems from the internet with all the equipment and everything they need to buy from the shop, and then they can run their own anti-bullying or bullying reporting systems. <coughs> This is a world map of coverage. We've had no money for marketing or anything. This is viral spread. Users using it, doing cool things, telling other people, people going on the web and downloading it. We don't get involved in any of this stuff. So these people have done it on their own. We've won a bunch of awards, and, and being here is, is fantastic recognition, I think, of the work of the users more than anything, because they're the ones that have the stories. And we've been in the media. And this isn't bad, actually, for a piece of software that I wrote in 2005 from a kitchen table in Finland. That's the view. I had out of the window. <laughs> had no money, nothing, but just had a hunch that this was useful. And I think the, the message there is you do not need lots of money, lots of resources, and to know big names to actually get these things done. If you're passionate and you find a solution you believe in and you stick to it, after maybe five or six years, it will pay off. I, I wish it had paid off a little bit earlier, perhaps. <laughs> Quickly, what's coming up next is a, a USB stick version. The computer's a bit of a barrier for most NGOs. Let's have it on a USB stick. You can go to an internet cafe, plug it in, do your stuff. Uh, how about running one off a phone so you don't need a computer at all? You just carry this messaging hub in your pocket on a phone. And we're adding picture messaging this month, which will allow farmers and healthcare workers to transmit pictures around the network, which could actually really help farmers and healthcare workers deliver better services. Very, very quickly, if you build these technologies to work in these places, make sure that the, the bits and pieces people have to buy are available locally, not things they have to order from a very, very far away. Make sure they plug together well. Maybe IKEA is not a great example because I always end up with dozens of bits and pieces left over when I try and build a table. <laughs> but make sure things plug together and people can understand how that works. Make them free or cheap. Don't put a price barrier up if you've brought a technology barrier down because you've still got a barrier. Make sure it can replicate. Allow people to talk and share and spread news and, and basically help each other out. Forget the internet. Absolutely forget the internet. If you forget the internet, you can do a lot. And also allow them to connect and provide online services if they can get online to talk to each other and to share experiences and stories. We've managed to do that too. And go outside your comfort zone. So I just love this cartoon. It's the second Gary Larson cartoon of the morning, actually, funnily enough. But if you're a techie, go outside your techie box. If you're a social scientist, go outside of your social scientist box. I think that's absolutely crucial. And think appropriately, this book was written in 1973, and it's still as valid today in a world that didn't exist when this book was written. And don't compete. Kids don't care who vaccinates them. They just want to get a vaccination. So let's work together and genuinely cooperate. And then the logo, this is a kid doing the front on SMS logo. It's an empowerment theme. We decided uh, for a branding agency called Wyden Kennedy that empowerment was a key theme. This kid's doing that logo. It's actually this. It's a textable logo, backslash O forward slash, which represents that that logo, and we're getting pictures of users <laughs> doing this logo, which is quite random and strange. I actually have a whole load of badges with me today. If anyone wants one of these badges, they're incredibly collectible. Uh, 
And we have users in the UK as well who are also doing this. So it, we've got something going on here, and it's fun, but I think it shows a connection we've made by trusting the users and allowing them to do what they do and not get in the way and interfere. And I think let's go back really to the beginning and, and just think about all the innovation we see around us in, in the countries that we live in, this part of the world. And we just forget sometimes, I think, there's actually another world out there where a lot of what we're doing doesn't make any sense. And the technology that we're using does have immense power, whether it's a security alert to a field worker in Afghanistan, or whether it's a health message to a HIV uh, sufferer in rural Zambia. Those things can be really, really crucial. So let's, not, let's not, not get too carried away with the exciting iPad, iPhone stuff, and let's maybe just pause a moment and just ask the question, who are we really innovating for? Thank you very much.